And I'll double check my settings. Okay, going live. Great, should be live now. Um, I don't expect anyone's here immediately, but uh, I will start talking as I do some things uh, with the business on camera. So, especially since I'm recording this and we'll be uploading it to YouTube later. Um, hopefully we've got some better video quality than last time. Great uh, upside down focus indication there. Better autofocus, hopefully, yep. Right? Well, we won't start this business not going. And got a number of pieces of bismuth from last session here on the right side. I'll try to go through some of these. Um, this is one of my more favorite. Let's see if we can yeah, pull focus. Yeah, there we go. One of my more favorite crystals. I like how it's two of these square shapes right next to each other. And so somehow they just formed that way. I can't quite tell whether they're actually like the same part of the same crystal or not, but they're close enough that it doesn't really matter. It just looks pretty neat. Um, this might be the largest one I have right now that I've grown. Well, still gotta figure out how to get the focus to work. Um, well, sort of focused. Hopefully you can see it. It's kind of toasty up here with my hands above the fire. Yeah, this looks decent, at least on my end of the screen. Um, so this one, it was grown floating in the melt like so many others. Still a little bit of tweezer marks there from where I pulled it out. But it also touched the bottom of the melt when it was growing. So there was about, the, you know, exactly this much liquid vertically. Um, and this whole thing grew down uh, from the top and touch the bottom uh, and I think I was probably kind of lucky to pull it out so that's another pretty special one um, not sure about these other three here I forget whether they were from this past session this one has a lot of nice details with little corners and curls uh, see some fine edges there well resolved features um, might have been from last time although can't quite tell, and at some point with this many bismuth crystals, it becomes a bit of a blur. Uh, and some of these other ones are just nice examples of the form, the shape. They have some combination of these features and uh, so forth. Uh, I will probably end up melting down a number of these. Um, tonight is going to be a little more experimental than other nights. Uh, Probably going to try some experiments with some with trying to uh, grow crystals on intentional cold points in the melt. I'll be melting down some of the old crystals, and when I do, I'm going to. Um, so this one is small, but has nice detail. When I do melt down some of the old crystals, uh, for some of them, I'm going to try to um, melt them back part way, and then see if I can regrow from them. I don't think it'll work, but it will be fun to try, and that would be one way of sort of seeding a crystal. So I won't be trying to seed it right from the total extent of its growth, but if I get the timing right, I'll be able to melt off some of the crystal, and then when crystallization proceeds again, it'll proceed from the partially molten existing crystal. Uh, and that might or might not be interesting. Um, uh, it'll, be, it'll be a little hard to tell, but uh, we'll give it a try. Um, and uh, yeah, let me know if you have any questions at any time. This uh, bit here is starting to melt around the edges.
Hmm? Oh, it's still not credit square. Yeah. We're fiddling with the settings here. Oop. We yeah, need a slightly stiffer camera mount here. But... It looks super cool because of the heat. Hmm. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm unmuted now, so... All right, so this melt is proceeding quickly. The, the gas flame does a pretty good job. I'm actually gonna you know, turn it down and melt a little more slowly um, so that we don't oxidize too much on top, although I don't really have much control over that. Um, while we're doing that, we'll continue looking at some of these older bismuth crystals. Oh, and maybe with the better camera, we can now see. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, maybe now we can see focus, so, okay. It's not the easiest thing to see, but you can hopefully, uh, I think I can see on my screen here, how these sort of this sort of triangular shape on the back comes down to a single point at the center. Um, oh, I guess there's, it's, it's tracking the focus. Uh, still getting used to this new camera, um, but that would actually be where the whole crystal nucleated when it was floating on top. So even though we didn't get a whole lot of depth here where the crystal, with the crystal growing down into the melt, um, not too far, uh, we still got some pretty good crystals on it, and you can see that it all comes from this one point. And I think that's one of the really neat things. Um, and in a in a sense, like all crystals of, of different scales, you know, the tiny tiny crystals in these tweezers uh, come from. Uh, they have to start at you know, you start from all liquid atoms, and then uh, suddenly two atoms are stuck together, no longer being liquid, and and it grows from there. Let's see what else I got in here. While we're waiting for this to fully melt. It's a uh, Sort of funny how, well, it, okay, now that now this uh, mass of bismuth here is floating in the liquid that's around it. It's really rounded shapes. It's not floating a whole lot yet. It's uh, probably because most of the heat is on the sides of the bowl here and not up in the middle and not or, or not directly below the center. I don't know if, can't really, I can't really slide this to the side anyway. And the more I move it around, the more slag I'll just create on the surface that I can't really use. Um, but we're going to do uh, a few experiments tonight, um, including one of them will be, I'll probably put a bunch of my sort of slag, sort of metal stuff back into the pot for a while, uh, stir it around a little bit and see if I can um, hopefully wind up with a, maybe press some of the liquid metal out of it very carefully with a spoon um, to at least uh, condense the slag and get some of the metal back out. Um, I'm still thinking in my mind about future experiments where, uh, you know, it'd be a totally different process from here, but where I attempt to um, either reclaim the bismuth from the slag by sort of uh, dissolving it in an acid and then uh, re-extracting the bismuth from the bismuth salt or doing some sort of, um, sort of assay or smelting where I, um, heat up the bismuth oxide slag with a whole lot of charcoal, and hopefully the, the carbon would then carry away the oxide, leaving the metal behind, because uh, it probably, or hopefully wouldn't want to form bismuth carbide. Less and less molten bismuth. So we're gonna, we'll start with, um, start with this getting completely molten. I'm gonna turn the heat down further because I don't, you know, I don't want to overheat it too much. This remaining amount should, should melt pretty soon. The flame's almost off now. And uh, then we'll, we'll try to get one or two batches of crystals before we start throwing other stuff in. The, the level here is a little low, so I definitely want to add in the crystals that I'm not keeping for now um, to remelt those. Uh, and then I will also probably add in some of this big chunk of bismuth, um, if not the, probably the whole thing. Um, to, oh, and I've, I've also got this, uh, I'll pr probably add that in just to get the level back up. I also do have this whole um, poured out bowl of bismuth. Let me just try to angle that and have this mug for the camera a little bit. Focus, focus, focus on my finger. Yeah. Let's see. Still learning. I can, I can try the thing where it makes the numbers show up on the screen. Focus, ah, hey. Well, I don't know if I can do anything about the visual there, but it's nice that it pulled the focus for me. Um, so I could also melt this down because I don't really feel like breaking all these crystals out. Uh, 
And the cool part is really when you pour the stuff out of this, it's nice to keep it around so I can show what happens when I do that, but I'm not sure I want to keep this one in particular. Um, it's a good reminder that for me that the, the bismuth is very ephemeral. So, okay, we are totally molten now. Take a, turn this off completely. Ooh. The uh, butane decided to give a little poof there. Yeah. Oh, well, not super over molten. It's not, it's not clouding up completely quickly. So maybe decent timing on the, on the melt here. And we'll, we'll see how this one comes out in terms of crystallizing. I'm trying to adjust my light here a little bit more so that I can see it better. Hopefully it's not darkening too much there on the view. And I guess I could also be adjusting the... Oh, <laughs> cannot change the ISO right now. All right, so uh, at least on the trying to see what the camera sees, don't see the color changing a whole lot, but let's try some more. Oh, and there's this mysterious, I don't know what that little dot is there. I'll let, let it be for now. It would have been a cold current of air or something. See a little bit of color change there. I think maybe what I want is some more directional lighting or specular lighting or something in the future. But I, I, again, yeah, I think this is pretty good for now. This is a, I like it being a work in progress instead of uh, it all being perfect from the get go. Then there's nothing to, nothing to fix. We're definitely getting crystallization at the sides, which cool off faster than the top, too, which is always a little annoying. But I, there's there's some floating ones right there that might sort of congeal into a cluster. We'll see what happens with those. Sometimes, you know, it's, it's been, always been pretty unpredictable. Oh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff happening in here. So, like, something just floated up over there. There's a little square one there. I'm going to attempt fate by zooming in a little bit and I apologize for the camera wiggles, but it's nice to be able to get a close look at these. Uh, I have the advantage of being able to put my face closer to this than is necessarily advisable, but um, I can only get the camera so close with this setup for now. Um, yeah, this one is free floating. I think it floated off the bottom and I'll nudge it into the center. See if we can encourage its growth a bit more. I'll keep my eye on it. Um, I'm not too worried about disturbing the growth of these crystals that have already nucleated. Sometimes I like to tap just to see where the ripples are for maybe any other crystals that are hiding within. There's something happening over here. That one's, you can see the edge is starting to even float up a little bit. I've got a convenient pointer on the end of my tweezer here. You know, give these a bit longer before turning the heat back on. Oh, and removing them, of course. Oh, and I'll just try to fix the camera rotation there. A little bit better. Apologize, apologies if... Uh, the not quite squareness is um, bothering anyone. So I'll try to be keeping it mostly square for the evening. Mm. I do get a little suspicious when these large floating crystals don't move around a lot because I feel like I'm worried that they may have gotten themselves stuck to the sides, but it looks like they're just growing slowly. It's okay. Might clear out some of the neighbors. It's like this one here. Not a whole lot going on with it. It's a pretty small crystal. It's a you know, maybe you know, nice little uh, some nice detail in there a little bit. 
focus, focus, don't let me get my hand too close to this. Uh, hey, magic focus square. Um, yeah, maybe I need a special plate for focusing on or something. Could probably do that. Uh, but this one, you know, could maybe be a little cabochon or something. Maybe I'll, uh, I'll set it down there. Yeah. See if we can put it where it will be in whoop, in frame, but not at too much risk of remelting. Yeah, that's not too bad. Okay, back to the main attraction. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Um, yeah, let's, before it gets too big, we'll go for this one. Let's see what we've got. Just broke a piece off of it already. But it feels nice and heavy. And when we flip it over, ah, okay. It's fun. We've got uh, a little cluster of similarly oriented crystals and a flat part off to the side with some nice square shapes. And I think hopefully now we can get a good view or decent view of how these uh, colors change as they go. So we'll get this off the tweezers. Just a little wiggle with the pliers there. Set that one down here. And hopefully not too close. And we'll go for this larger one floating here. Which again, I think this one floated right up from the bottom, so gives it maybe a little bit more freedom of how the shape can be instead of just what will float at the surface. Oh, and it feels nice and heavy. So this would be a, oh yeah, lucky first crystal. This really well-defined uh, sort of cube shape here. And I'm gonna try to, try to get it to focus. Focus, please. And just hopefully holding it still enough that um, what I, want, what I want to be visible is how it is going through the changing colors. And I think it, I think it is, because I, at least from here, it looks like it's gone from gold to blue to purple. Uh, it may keep going around a bit as it uh, cools off. But yeah, so um, lucky timing, maybe uh, affected a little bit by a bunch of practice, but uh, whatever it is, whatever the case, I'm glad to have made this crystal. This is pretty good one for for my experience in general all right now is there anything else that I want to try to get out of here before it freezes I think I'm I think I'm good those are I think those are all likely to be pretty uh, shallow underneath the surface and not as exciting as those two that I did just pull out so we will remelt and we're gonna add some of um, we're gonna add some of the last sessions crystals We'll be saying goodbye to them one by one. Uh, oh no, maybe maybe that's silly, but um, uh, yeah, the, these ones are these ones are neat. They're all you know all the crystals are crystals. They're all special. They all have neat colors, um, but uh, I don't need to keep all of them. And I would just like to keep experimenting with this process of melting and remelting. Um, and so uh, I will be going through these and adding some of them back to the melt. Um, in the future, maybe I'll start putting bismuth crystals in the mail. Uh, but for now, if you need bismuth crystals, there are really quite a lot of other places you can get them. Uh, or you can make the investment and start uh, making them yourself if you are uh, you know, really up to your safety protocols on making bismuth crystals. And since I haven't said anything about it yet tonight, now's a good time to mention um, what I'm doing to be safe here. Uh, first and foremost, safety glasses. I don't want to get any of this molten stuff in my eye. I only have two of them and I can't regrow. Uh, but the other things that are important for me safety-wise are education and training. So um, I know a fair bit about the bismuth metal itself. I have some training in laboratory practices and experiencing work, experience working with high temperature stuff. Um, I'm also a, you know, an adult and uh, I can take responsibility for both myself and my environment here. Um, and so that, you know, uh, don't try this at home unless you're really, really sure that your home is a good place to be trying stuff like this. Um, maybe make sure you have some experience with uh, handling other things at high temperatures. Make sure you've got some safety glasses, some other equipment, some plans for if anything goes wrong, like 
where is the fire extinguisher or uh, is someone around to help me if I get a severe burn? That kind of thing. And I wonder, huh. now we, we were visited again by the uh, magic focusing square. Not sure what it's doing. Maybe if I put that button, no, well, it doesn't really make it go away. Well, we'll see. So we've melted most of the other stuff that was in here, I think. Yeah, it's, well, there's still some stuff on the bottom, um, but I'm gonna keep feeding some extra crystals in here just to raise the level a little bit. Um, and sort of uh, yeah. get these, uh, get the, these masses back in the melt. Still want to save a few of these for that experiment I was mentioning earlier. Um, probably the larger the better. This one, this one is, hmm, yeah, I'll try it with that one. That one, I think, came from the side of the bowl. It's got a big hunk of solid bismuth on it. That's but maybe uh, a bunch of crystals. And I just did, okay, <laughs> a teachable moment there. I dropped a piece of bismuth in from a very small height, and at that height, I got a tiny splash of molten bismuth on my thumb. Um, did not burn, not even first degree, but uh, it was surprising. And it's an example of why I should use tweezers to introduce everything else into the melt, or pliers. It's embarrassing to make a mistake like that, but it's very important to acknowledge those mistakes uh, both for intellectual honesty and to teach oneself and others about them. Are you okay? Uh, so yes, I'm totally fine. Uh, and we will see if I turn down this heat even further as I slowly add these uh, extra pieces. I got a fair number, they're small, but I got a fair number of good crystals last time. And also a fair number of crystals that I do not need to keep around. But um, yeah, I suppose this will be a decent demonstration of the idea that, the, that you know, it, it's all just the same metal. The colors come from the oxide. Um, all these things will disappear into this melt and when they melt their oxide skins will float to the surface because it's much less dense than the metal itself and uh, we'll skin it off and the pure metal will be left underneath. We'll have lost some of the mass to the oxidation in the process which is a little bit of a pain well, but not too bad and then we'll make some more crystals. So we turn the heat off again. And maybe that's probably enough for now. Raise the level a bit. Turn up the heat a little bit. Get this stuff to melt. And see whether what's happening around again. Yep. Okay. So uh, everywhere that these crystals aren't is quite hot. So it won't take too long to melt this. Some of the slag right on the side. If the, the, it's tempting to let the slag build up, but it will just get thicker and thicker and thicker. To some extent, it will inhibit more slag from thick, fill, uh, happening underneath. But I'd still usually rather see what the crystals are doing themselves. So, um, but it looks like now we're totally molten anyway. Ready to skim. Oh, get a little more heat, and we'll see what we get with uh, this refreezing, resolidification of this bismuth. I'm gonna wait a few minutes or so to skim the other side of the bowl, um, just because I can tell it's it is a bit overheated. Well, can't my, my curiosity will get the best of me, but uh, again, we can see there. There's that 
briefly that pure silver color, the pure bismuth right before it starts oxidizing, but it changes color so quickly because uh, it is very hot and it wants to react with the, with the air. Yes, um, about 273 uh, degrees Celsius or 271 is the temperature here. I just noticed the message in the chat. Um, so we're close to 550 Fahrenheit, hotter than you'd probably get on the stove or in your oven, but I mean, well, uh, but that's because water boils at 100 C. When you, when you don't boil the water, you can definitely get hotter than that. Focus, focus back on this again. What, what makes the camera focus? It's focusing on its reflection. Oh, the camera is focusing on its reflection, apparently. We'll pull back just a little bit here. It is kind of neat that you, you know, whenever you have a molten metal liquid mirror, um, it's kind of interesting and I guess apparently uh, has consequences for the autofocus system of this camera. We'll start taking another look at how this uh, slag here is doing. One thing I'd like to add to this setup in the future is, um, well, one electric heating mantle for better temperature control, but also thermocouples for better temperature measurement so that I can, uh, for example, I'm certainly overheating it at times, um, but I don't know how much I'm overheating it by. I might be getting it up to 350 Celsius. I might be at 300. Uh, but the other thing is that um, materials have a, a melting point and a freezing point, the temperatures at which they, you know, uh, or a melting point and a boiling point where they change phases. Um, but there's also super cooling and especially in pure materials, uh, like, you know, say very pure ice water, you can often super cool them, um, below their freezing point, And then something like a vibration will, uh, cause them to start crystallizing. And when they're, when they crystallize below their, uh, freezing point, they'll often crystallize more rapidly. Okay. So this looks like a situation where in the wake of skimming, with the spoon, we started forming some crystals right away. Maybe we'll turn on, just zoom right back in and hope that focus behaves. Sorry for the wiggles there. You should be able to see right around here that these sort of feathery shapes of the tops of these crystals are floating off or, or growing along the top of the mountain. Uh, molten metal oxides heavier than the molten metal. I think probably not, although there might be a ch <laughs> there's, um, there's some chance with, uh, some of the really light metals. So in almost any case, the oxygen is lighter than the metal that it's oxidizing. Um, so, uh, just sort of by density, you're, you're putting a, a lighter atom next to it, but, um, you know, sodium, uh, lith lithium and sodium are certainly, um, lighter than uh, oxygen so um, you might so you might have a situation where uh, you oxidize uh, you know well if, you, if you've got molten sodium exposed to air it just kind of catches fire but um, if you had molten sodium and molten uh, and sodium oxide in a vacuum I think you could probably get the uh, sodium oxide to sink in the molten sodium. And I could be totally wrong about that, but um, I think in general, uh, the oxides are always going to float. And that's really convenient for um, all sorts of smelting processes, copper making, steel making, any time where you want to separate a metal from its oxide. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I do not want to make, well, it's very easy to make molten sodium and I actually, I could do it tonight um, because I have a sodium vapor lamp. Uh, that's actually the only way I'd want to make a sodium, uh, molten sodium indoors. Maybe, I mean, maybe if I had a little glass ampoule, then I could like melt it in my hand safely. But, um, in fact, that, that's what a sodium vapor uh, lamp is. It has some, uh, it has some electrodes in it, high voltage. It will, um, melt the sodium, vaporize some of it. Um, so I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull many crystals out of here, but it's been hopefully good for the camera to see, uh, this sort of Christmas tree shape of, uh, crystals growing here. We've got some stuff floating here and this stuff over here. Um, 
Yeah, the, so the more interesting, the, so it's not too surprising that um, uh, bismuth oxide floats on molten bismuth. What is sort of surprising is that solid bismuth floats on molten bismuth. Um, and in fact, other solid metals will also float on molten bismuth, um, which I don't have a, I will probably demonstrate the next time around. Um, the, uh, like, you know, steel will float in molten bismuth. The bis steel is heavy, bismuth is heavier. Um, I get this. Ooh. Feels like it's getting crowded in here. I just feel sort of crunchy feelings as I make any contact with the tweezers. Uh, so a little flat crystal again, more of a maybe like a cabochon. I don't know. I don't really I don't really love these, but these are probably the ones that you would want to make uh, jewelry with if you were going to do some wire wrapping or resin casting or something. Um, because usually you don't want jewelry that's super, super volumetric. Uh, and yeah, very yes, exactly. As the as the chat has me covered. Good evening, Owen. Uh, good, and good evening to uh, Clara. Thanks for joining us. Um, so there's you know there's bismuth. There's uh, water ice. First water ice phase. Yes, first phase water ice. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. I'm pretty pleased with this one. Again, wishing the camera would focus a little more predictably. A little cautious about putting my hand under it. Let's try the super close up. Hey, all right. Now it'll. Uh, so, extreme close up for this crystal that I just pulled out. Probably a little too light to really see the colors change. Oh. Yeah, I will uh, try a new focus tool on the next thing I pull out, um, thanks to a hidden off-screen assistant. And uh, hey, great. Right. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Oh, I see. Your, your, your URL got clipped and then you URL shortened it. Um, let's see if I can get anything else out of here. Uh, no, I think we're, we're going to go for another remelt here. And while I melt, I'll think about what I try next. Um, yeah, I think, I think for this one we will um, take a look at my huge pile of slag here. Or, or dross. This is accumulated from many, many such demos. And I will uh, carefully add a lot of this to the melt and then hopefully be able to um, separate. There, there's still a lot of metal in this stuff that I've got here. Hopefully it will sort of sort itself out and allow the uh, oxide to float to the surface and for me to recover some of the metal here. It may do the opposite. It may be counterproductive, but this is what I'm going to try for this round. Um, something that's a little tricky to play with. I think there are, there's, there's, there's got probably a good Roundup article somewhere of, um, of materials, and maybe that's in fact what is in the link. Um, while I'm waiting for this to melt, I will check that. Hopefully not mess up my streaming by opening a thing. Uh, uh, water ice, gallium, germanium and silicon, acetic acids. Okay, so a few, not a lot. Um, but yeah, it, it's a it's a pretty interesting topic. And one that I'm certainly happy to mess around with here. Um, one of the topics I talked about a little bit last time was methods. I think it's uh, you know there's certainly as we've seen with um, with this thing, well, this is what happens when you pour out the um, bismuth that's inside the bowl as it's crystallizing in from the sides. 
And this is happening every time I pull crystals off the top. We just don't see it because it's sunk beneath the waves of molten bismuth. Uh, if I could keep the sides from cooling down as much, this wouldn't happen, which would leave crystals more room to form on the top. But I could also use a process like this to just crystallize some stuff, pour it off, and then break the crystals apart, depending on what my reasons were for uh, making crystals and wanting to make a lot of them. I'm going to turn the heat down as I continue adding some more of these sort of uh, skimmings back to the melt. Some of these look more sandy and powdery than others, but they're usually fairly metallic. And I suppose I could, I could try doing a, uh, Oh, I'm asking myself why I use a spherical bowl versus a flat bottom. Um, I think that's a pretty good question too. You know, I probably should try a flat bottom. I think the idea is sort of that it's maybe a little more efficient to heat a spherical bowl, has a larger surface area to volume ratio. So, um, so if the heat of the flames go right up the sides, then I get a pretty good heat transfer from the gas flame into the bowl. But that's really not my chief concern, and that would probably still happen if I had a flat bottom bowl. Um, I think, I guess a uh, flat bottom might also keep stick stuff from sticking to the bottom as much, and it might make it easier to insulate the sides. Um, I guess maybe when I started doing this many years ago, I just couldn't resist the appeal of these um, stainless steel IKEA bowls, uh, which is actually, yes, these, in case you were wondering, these bowls are from IKEA. Um, I do not have a sponsorship deal with them, nor am I likely to. Uh, so this is going to be, it's going to look like a big mess for a few minutes. It's a good time for more questions or thoughts or suggestions, um, even if they're from myself. Um, ah, induction heating. I would love to try induction heating. I have not tried induction heating. Um, I don't think I could, uh, so the household induction stoves are great, um, but they're very much designed to heat ferrous metals uh, and they have a lot of safety features to make sure that they don't like um, overboil your water or uh, and, you know, melt your metal pans. So I might not, I, I, um, I would need to heat, I would need to try to heat, uh, I would need to circumvent some things about a household induction stove to use that. Now, a full-blown induction furnace, um, I could theoretically try that. I know it's it's certainly, um, you know, the, the uh, 75 kilowatt um, induction furnace in the MIT Forge and Foundry uh, has certainly melted bismuth before because I, I know the instructor that's done it there. Um, but... Uh, um, it, that doesn't, you know, if you, so if you want to make a really big bismuth casting, um, it's good for that. It would not be super great for, uh, this crystallization stuff necessarily. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be bad. Um, you'd need a lot of bismuth and you'd want to turn the furnace down pretty low. Uh, it would probably, um, melt, uh, things nice and quickly. All right. Well, so I'm going to try to gently stir to introduce this stuff into the, into the melt. I hope that, you know, the, the heavier metal will sink down. The lighter oxide will stay on top. Um, but the, uh, the light oxide that stays on top is still pretty heavy. And so this, yeah, as I said, this might be counterproductive. We'll see. <laughs> um, yeah. Plug for MIT's foundry. Uh, it's a, it's a fun place. Um, if you get a chance to visit, it's good. If you're if you are just a tourist walking around MIT, um, uh, um, if you if you go to MIT, uh, try to get into the casting or blacksmithing classes, even if you're not a material science person. If you're just a tourist walking around MIT, um, uh, if you take a take some stairs down from the infinite corridor that run you know the famous infinite corridor that runs through the main campus, if you take the stairs down, you can peer in the windows of the Forge and Foundry and the Glass Lab across the hall. Um, there's some neat artistic details in the floor and the ceiling and the walls at that point and the, even the door handles uh, shaped like beavers. Um, and so there's some neat stuff there um, worth looking at. And sometimes, uh, depending on the time, you might see 
um, students working on uh, forging steel, the forge part, or um, people working with that induction furnace and casting metal. A lot of times you can see work in progress projects through the windows too, which can be neat. So it looks like, yeah, can't, I can't really tell if I've been effective here. I feel like the volume of crud is maybe smaller than before and the volume of liquid is a little bit higher. Um, in fairness, uh, the MIT Foundry has only been so neat in the Infinite Carter for a few years now. Um, the, it used to be that the, the forge used to share space with the glass lab, and that was sort of visible. Um, but thanks to wealthy donors and recent renovations, I guess, um, they now have their own spaces. So the, the Foundry was in this tiny little room like uh, at the end of the corridor, um, pretty cramped. Still great that we you know were able to do um, metal casting and stuff in there, but not as nice as it is now where there's plenty of room to work and work on different projects simultaneously. So so if you, if you didn't see it before, um, it's it's almost uh, easier to view now. Um, and every so often, I think there are public events. So I'm not the most in tune with it right now. Right, so yeah, I think these globs of slag I'm getting out are, uh, uh, the move was about, um, uh, I want to say around 2014 or 2015, um, probably completed. So, you know, recent in terms of MIT overall. I mean, yeah, actually, so, the camera may be showing how there's this powdery stuff here, and that actually is encouraging me that it's just bismuth oxide and it's not mixed up with a ton of metal. Um, so, so maybe this, I don't know, it, it feels awkward sort of trying to squidge around um, sponges of uh, wet metal powder. Um, I'm not sure what's happening with this chunk here. Let me give it a few more seconds. But, um, but it looks like it maybe worked. And by now I probably have the rest of the melt way overheated. Uh, polarizing film. Um, yeah, the renovations took a while to move the forge and foundry. Uh, polarizing film. I do have some polarizing film. I don't have it exactly handy right now. I might, um, during a remelt, I might try to grab some. I doubt that it will have a noticeable effect, but it is, it is worth trying. I'm sure I, the, the way I've got my light sources set up here, there probably is some plain polarization of light off of the, off of the surface here. All right, and we'll turn this off and we'll uh, see if we can get a few more crystals out. So, uh, from, from sort of dirty in one sense back to clean with, um, yeah, maybe oh, that might've worked. <laughs> uh, more, there's more experiments to do, but that was at least not discouraging. Um, although still there's a bit more to skim here. Yeah, if I had if the the polarizing film experiment would be especially interesting if I had some more directional or positionable uh, lighting set up. Oh, um, I don't have as many polarizing sunglasses handy, um, but I do. But no, I I do actually have sheets of polarizing film because sometimes it's fun to have sheets of polarizing film around uh, to look at, you know, they say you have a clear plastic spoon and you want to look at the internal stresses left over from injection molding. Well, you can um, put it between two sheets of polarizing film and, and backlight it and uh, look at it that way. That's, I, I don't have the means to link to anything like that right now, but it's really fun. But the other, the other really cool trick I learned from a coworker of mine now is that if you have one sheet of polarizing film and a laptop, uh, the laptop has its light polarized to make the um, LCD, the liquid crystal display work. So you can use your um, 
laptop screen as a source of polarized light and then just use one sheet of polarized light to examine clear objects for internal stresses. Um, and the phenomenon going on there for anyone who hasn't heard of this is that, um, uh, well, I, I won't get into trying to explain the polarization of light right now, but light can have a polarization and that can affect how it interacts with materials. But the stresses and strains inside materials can also affect how the polarization gets rotated. And uh, so there's a, a neat effect that for some materials, especially clear ones, you can see interesting things when you look at them. Oh, we've got some crystals floating here and I should not disturb them too much. Yeah, the, unfortunately the camera is, I don't know, I'll have to try some different things with it. I think it, it may be the angle. The camera is not quite picking up the saturation of the colors on top of the melt. So you'll, uh, for now you'll have to take my word for it. Um, I'm try to nudge this little crystal closer to the center. Oh, we've got, we've got sort of a, a trapezoid over here. That hopefully you can see. Um, and a few other things happening in this melt. Uh, so after we got a few crystals out of this one, the next thing I'll do is we'll try to we'll try to float some other metal on the bismuth just to see that, and also to see whether um, that sort of acts as a, a, a greater heat sink to cause the bismuth to crystallize a little bit more intensely. Okay, photoelasticity. Uh, well, thank you for thank you, chat uh, everyone for providing um, uh, links to these things that I'm talking about. I do, yeah. I mean, uh, it's great to be curious and find ways to learn more about this stuff, and I will check those out uh, later. Oh, what was, did something? I was looking at the looking at the screen. And I thought I saw the bismuth do something interesting, but it may have just been a normal little wiggle or wobble. This one, I think, started out sort of trapezoidal, but has gone kind of Christmas tree on us. Huh. The ripples certainly look different in the camera view than from, uh, from, from directly overhead than from here. And uh, I will try the... Um, at some point, I will try providing some vibration or applying some vibrations to this as it cools, uh, but still probably not tonight. Um, more not more than just the, the tapping here. Um, yeah, that this crystal is fairly large. Picked up a passenger on the side. Um, this one is going to run into stuff. So even though it, it's a fun trapezoid friend, I'm going to try to. Move it from this corner if I can. Maybe not. Okay, have to go from another side. Oh, it's very thin and spindly and kind of got away from me. Oh, I, and actually, uh, before I uh, before I try floating, well, maybe we'll do both. Um, just remembered that the other thing I want to try is trying to melt back some of these crystals here. It's not quite the way I wanted to zoom out. Melt back some of these crystals here and see if I can get new growth to uh, form on them as they melt. Okay, this this looks pretty big, and as uh, I, well, I am. Oh, it feels heavy. So, this, I don't know, it's uh, another thing that I can't quite communicate of the feeling of um, how much heavier the crystal is than, than it looks. Oh, not super heavy, but we've got some interesting, we have a, we have a spire here. Let's see, oh, I'm gonna try the new focus tool. Maybe that works. Good, good color contrast, at least. Blue hexagon wool coaster. But yeah, the, the sensation of lifting out uh, different bismuth crystals um, you can sort of tell based on how heavy it is. Although I was expecting this one to be a, a little bit deeper, but it is it is very wide. So and we've got a bunch of interesting crystal features going on there. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And of course, uh, another thing, if you're just joining us tonight, um, bismuth is both soft and brittle, which is why this one sort of crunched around and bent a little bit, but made crunching sounds while it did. Um, and why if you do want to get some bismuth of your own and use it for jewelry, you will need to try to protect it fairly carefully, whether with a wire wrapper or resin casting or something. It would be pretty strange if um, you could put people between polarized light sources and see how much stress they were under, but I think we're all glad that we can't. Uh, it would probably be uh, more harm than good, but it's great for inanimate materials. Which uh, I'm reacting to the, <laughs> under a lot of stress here title uh, you mentioned in that link you sent. All right, so for this one, I'm gonna to try to get it a little overheat, back off the heat, and then add one or more of these. Maybe we'll get um, a little fancy and add a, uh, try. For, for our steel, we'll add this nut. Which might be, might be galvanized, I don't know. I've, I've, at first when I did this, I was a little bit worried about um, contaminating the bismuth with other materials. But I've since come to the conclusion that it really does not want to dissolve a whole lot of other stuff and reduce its purity. Uh, if it did, I would probably notice and um, I'd be out a few pounds of bismuth and have to get some more pure stuff. But for so far, it just doesn't seem to want to uh, pick up other stuff and stop forming crystals. Um, so theoretically, the purity of this bismuth is close to the original uh, 99.99 percent that I was quoted by the supplier. I don't know if it's actually that pure, but sources seem to suggest that if it's not that pure, it's hard to form any good crystals at all. And there's also examples of, say, 99.9 percent .9 pure bismuth or 99 or 98 percent pure bismuth forming much smaller, less interesting crystals. Um, bismuth in that purity might be sold for uh, shot for shotgun shells or um, fishing weights or ballast. So this seems not, oh, yeah, maybe not too overheated. So we will um, we'll try this piece of bismuth here and we'll just put it back in the way it came out. And I'm not too sure what will happen here. But we'll just let that float for a bit. Hopefully it will remelt a bunch. And we will put this steel nut over here. You can see it floats pretty high on the metal because it's so much less dense. Um, and one other thing I've played around with a little bit is what about just a piece of wire? So I'm off camera, I'm cutting up a little piece of wire with some pointy ends and I'm try to float this on this bath of bismuth as well. A little... I will get practice with this focus. Um, let's try to put this in here. The bismuth will probably form around it. Oh, the, so the, around the steel nut has, has collected a fair amount of metal already. Ah, all right, yeah, this is a pretty good example here, I think. I, uh, I think I may have just shaken off one of the crystals from it. So in this case, I, f I uh, took a lot of the heat out of the metal at once. And so it started forming a lot of small crystals at once in a bunch of different directions. Let's see if I can focus on this a little bit. Oh, there we go. Pretty good. It's at least focusing on the wool. I can I can see the texture on the wool. Um, but so this it, it's just sort of spraying off these crystals in little directions. I'm not. There's probably something about that the spire shape that relates to how the the crystal nucleates and how it um, uh, how heat conducts through it, uh, but I'm not confident about making any uh, main state or you know uh, confident statements there. Let me put that there. I've got um, this is doing some stuff, but nothing huge yet. There's some other crystals just doing their own thing in here too. 
And let's see what happened with this one. This is, well, it's heavier now than it was before. Okay, and again, looks like what we have is that I had a crystal in there. I'm just going to totally remelt this one. Had a crystal with there. I was hoping it was going to melt back a little bit and then regrow from the same orientation. But it looks like it just, it was, uh, the melt maybe wasn't quite hot enough. And so this just sucked a whole bunch of heat out of it. I mean, I guess because it was at room temperature. Sucked a whole bunch of heat out of it and then um, formed a bunch of new small crystals. So I'm just, I'm actually going to just remelt this one right away to free that up. Um, let's see if there's anything interest, else interesting going on in here, like this crystal. Uh, another thing for first time viewers is notice that I'm trying to shake the molten bismuth out of the crevices of the crystal here. So this one is not as deep as I might be normally enthusiastic about. The focus tool, this is working better than nothing. Um, but a lot of good detail there, so that's a that's a keeper at least for now. Uh, I'm uh, lost a little track of what time you just asked those questions, Owen. Um, I did see these ones on a nut. Um, although I wouldn't, I mean, seed, I feel like you grow the crystal epitaxially. In my case, I just used a nut to cause them to nucleate. Um, and we'll see how this one that I did with the copper wire did. Um, but again, it looks like um, it's just the cold point introduces some causes it to make a little cluster of um, sort of spires. Let's check out this triangular one here. Uh, not much there. Okay, so not having high hopes for the rest of these crystals here. We will remelt, and this time um, I'm going to try putting one of the crystals in before it's fully molten or before I turn the heat off. Make sure that the uh, oxide um, gets off of it uh, before trying to remelt like that, uh, or before before letting it cool. Um, and I'll probably let's see where's the where did I just put the um, I missed the, <laughs> wherever I put the one with the copper on it, I think I maybe put it back here. And well, if the copper wire floats up, um, that will just be obvious, I guess. Uh, quartz might be interesting. I think the one thing to, if I really want to try to seed growth, and I actually looked into this a little bit, if I, if I got a material that had the right sort of atomic spacing uh, or lattice parameter as bismuth, um, I might be able to get bismuth to grow epitaxially or continue the crystal structure on that. I'm not too sure what kind of materials I could do. I've, I've only started to look in that, into that a little bit. Um, but I, I'm also skeptical that seed crystals are going to be quite what I want to do here. But I am, you know, it's, it's definitely, there's a, there's only so much I can play around with here and that's one of them. So I'll probably want to try again. I'm, oh, thank you, me. I'm still looking for the wire. I think there, there it is. So we will set that aside. I would have skimmed it off eventually, but it's good to get that removed. Uh, there's still some solid stuff here. Oh, 
okay. Nice molten, very hot. So, turn this down. Give it a pretty big crystal to chew on. Okay, maybe the uh, the little tweezer cast mark there will make it easy for me to whoop, turn it off. Okay, so oh, too slow. It's molten completely. Not quite the right timing. This is this is where uh, temperature monitoring would really help. Let's see how this one does. It's definitely melting. And the question is, will it stop? The answer is probably nope. <laughs> uh, Try one more. Yeah. I think that one disappeared completely as well. I wonder, it's a good time for me to see Okay, that's still a pretty fast oxide color change. So that gives me a bit of more of a clue. I suppose I could preheat the crystals before trying something like this. This is looking a little more promising, so I'll try one more of this chunk. And worst case, I'm just I'm just refilling the melt a little bit. I'm just recycling some crystals, so it's all right. As it, as this one melts, and I think it is, it's gonna start floating a little bit lower. But I think, but but then again, I only want it to melt a little bit. This one might work if I'm lucky. Yeah, now the the oxide color change is much slower, which is normally an indication to me that crystallization, you know, natural crystallization is, is imminent. They're just going to start forming on the top, and we may see that soon too. Um, hopefully, something is happening with that one. Oh, it's very light now. So if it is going to crystallize, I don't know if there's anything left but the oxide. Um, it may just be a really tricky timing problem. Well, even the oxide there might be, well, we'll see. We'll pull something up from it. Meantime, we'll watch for crystals and the rest of it. Maybe able to see through the camera some little some little circles on the melt, sort of little rainbows. And I'm not. I, I have to imagine that's just dust or something landing on the uh, on the liquid and causing some sort of pattern there. We are getting crystals floating in it now. So something there. Oh, so this, I tapped it and something floated up from the bottom. I'm going to grab that. 
It happens, but very rarely. Well, it's a little hard to grab. But another one of the special surprises is that sometimes you get a crystal that nucleates on the bottom, but is so weakly attached that its own buoyancy or vibrations from like me tapping it. Oh, come on, focus, please. There we go. Uh, its own buoyancy or vibrations from tapping it will cause it to just float up and bob to the surface. Um, so it's sort of a a special a special find. We're relatively rare in uh, my world of bismuth crystals. Um, and sometimes uh, coming from the bottom like that, I, their features are usually very three dimensional and well developed. Oh, hey, this is actually doing something, and it feels like it might be close to, well, it's pretty big, whatever it is. Oh, and it's falling apart as I shake it. So, um, mixed success. Here's the base. I'm going to set that down so I can rescue the crystals that I just knocked off. As uh, happened with some of these other experiments tonight, uh, further research needed. So... It looks like it seeded. It looks like it seeded this one here. Well, I still don't know if seed is the right word. It nucleated uh, this one. Although its connection is pretty tenuous there on the side. It looks like it came from a pretty small point, but it grew into like one big uh, structure. That's you know it's opposed to a cluster of separate crystals. So hey, that's that's pretty. Whoop! Almost lost that one to the floor. Uh, that's pretty neat and it also had something going on right over here right oh hey this one is nice and deep if I hold it here for a second we can probably watch the you can probably see the color change pretty well not sure how oops. How well that shows up. I think I do a few more sessions like this. I'll probably get pretty good with knowing where the camera is and how to get it to focus. But for now, it's a little rough. Okay. So yeah, I think that it hopefully had some visible color change and the camera's steady enough to see it. Um, let's get that out from back right, right, from right next to the burner. And see if we can get one or two. No, I think we're, okay, we're done with this batch. Um, let's see. Paper models of quasi-crystals. That sounds a lot of, that sounds pretty interesting. I don't know a whole ton about quasi-crystals other than that they, in my mind, my, my association with the uh, quasi-crystals is that they're sort of like, uh, Penrose tilings in that they have a mixture of long-range orders and short-range orders um, or long-range order that's not completely long-range order. Uh, crystals like bismuth, um, despite uh, their irregular appearance, involve just a sort of a, an orthorhombic or repetition of atoms in space, but uh, quasi-crystals um, at the shorter scale are, are pretty regular space, but then they have those uh, non-quite repeating things. And, and yes, uh, oh, and I have heard of some bismuth, maybe some of the, I forget whether the first bismuth, uh, first quasi-crystals discovered were bismuth compounds, but I, th I think they've since showed up in lots of places, including bismuth and many other um, uh, chemistries. Or, well, yeah, bis bismuth compounds and other chemistries. I don't know of any... Um, pure materials that do quasi-crystals, pure elements. Um, all right, with this one, um, an experiment I've done before but haven't done terribly recently, uh, is I'm just going to um, let this melt completely. I'm going to turn the heat off, and I'm going to go for crystals without skimming the oxide at all, which is going to be hard for me to resist the temptation. But just, you know, I have, if, if I've done this experiment, I haven't done it in years, uh, and... Um, maybe, I think, I think all it will reveal is that it's harder to see where the crystals are. Um, I will tap it though. It's harder to see where the crystals are when you don't skim it. 
Um, but maybe it'll reveal that I get some really cool crystals that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. It may also reveal that um, next time I reheat it and go to skim the slag, uh, the slag is really thick, but we'll see. Um, one of the things I would like to do in the future besides, say, electrically heat it or um, controllably heat it is try to shield it from oxidation with either a flow of shield gas such as nitrogen or perhaps um, a really high temperature heat transfer fluid, some sort of non-combustible oil. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether I could get a silicone oil that'll go high enough, but there are some other uh, heat transfer fluids that are okay being used in oxygen um, at 300 Celsius or above without bursting into flames. Um, would still present a whole bunch of other dangers like you know the bismuth already does being a molten metal at around 271 celsius but um i think that that would i think that uh it might lead to prettier looking crystals when i pull them out because um i think that the thinner the oxide layer is um the more saturated the colors are and having a layer of other heat transfer fluid on top of the bismuth crystal would makes it uh, would make it oxidize much more slowly before cooling down. And that that makes sense with the the paper models and the way that they would need to fit together for quasi crystals. Um, uh, hopefully, I imagine it's I imagine it's somewhat um, fun to experiment with the different arrangements that can be uh, that can be performed with those building blocks. I'm tapping with the tweezers, I'm trying tapping with the spoon. If I see one float up, I'll grab it. If not, we're gonna take a look and see whether we can even see crystals through this. We can see it's uh, well. For, again, my angle is slightly different than the cameras. I can see, I think it, the, the camera probably looks a bit more wrinkly than normal. Um, normally I would skim this stuff off. Yeah, I've been I've been a little interested in making some geometric models of crystals myself. Um, I'm really interested in space filling honeycombs, which are not quasi crystal and they're just regular, but uh, I think they'd be fun to model, especially if it could make them so that they were very sort of elastic and bouncy, maybe rigid edges but uh, flexible joints. Um, haven't worked on that in a while. There's some different ways to do it, but that's it's a it's a neat project. And for this, uh, at some point, if I'm doing more of these demonstrations, I probably want to have some. Um, crystal structured models just to show a few different types of crystal, rotate them in front of the camera, um, show uh, maybe what bismuth crystal, bismuth's crystal structure uh, theoretically or empirically looks like at the microscopic level and that sort of thing. I can definitely, so through some gentle wiggling here, we can see that it's crystallizing around the edges here, but I can't really tell if anything's happening in the middle. Um, I'll probably just start poking around. Oop. See if I feel something with the tweezers here. Oh, hey, turns out, okay, so I was able to find one crystal. Um, Decently sized crystal. Oh, hey. Okay, so I don't know if I'm actually, oh, <laughs> and like others, it appears to have fallen apart when I sh shook it. Um, I don't know if I'm learning a lesson here about different ways to make crystals or this is just pure luck, but I'm pretty pleased with this one. So uh, maybe I'll try this way again. Although um, locating the floating crystals by by uh, feel is pretty questionable as an approach. Mm. 
Okay, here's the other part. I'm not sure where it was attached. Oh, it looks like it was attached by this tiny little spindle here at the... The camera just refuses to focus on that. There we go. All right, and now back to here. Okay, great. Um, all right, so partial success there. Um, I think, okay, another thing that we may be able to do that's sort of interesting, and I think that's enough for this melt. Um, I'll try the copper wire again. In fact, I'll even use the same copper wire but we'll leave it in through the melt and refreeze cycle. So it'll, it'll just be floating here at the surface, hopefully not covered in oxide. Um, and we'll see whether it's, uh, it conducts, um, oh, uh, so, uh, Clara, with respect to the models, um, sort of like, like, um, there are some, ah, I can even show it on camera. Uh, I also remembered that I had a 3D printed honeycomb model. So there's this, um, I forget what this is called, but uh, it's this flexible toy that can be um, formed into a number of shapes and like triangularized or popped open. It's a little bit too big for, uh, yeah. Um, so there, there's this thing. And so you could make uh, joints of a honeycomb model out of these sort of rubber connectors with wooden dowels, and then you could bounce the whole thing around. Oh. Um, and then uh, I'm particularly interested in doing it for this honeycomb, which is the uh, tetrakaidecahedron honeycomb, or the, um, you could say the, it's the dual of the body-centered cubic crystal lattice. And I'm not great with all the math there, but um, that would be fun. Anyway, uh, so we've got the got this molten again. We're going to try to not disturb the little wire here, which is right, right there. We're not going to, we're going to skim around that and see if um, just maybe the copper, even though it's coated with bismuth and bismuth oxide, the copper sticking out of the melt will conduct heat away from the melt. And uh, so we know it's like fully at the molten bismuth temperature, but if it cools off more quickly, it'll get a crystal going there first. And that will be interesting. My face. Oh, <laughs> you can see my face in the thing and the camera wants to focus on it. Great. Um, yes, Kelvin foam. Uh, we'll zoom back in on this. You can, um, th this pattern of uh, oxidation around here may suggest that in fact it is having that cooling effect I described, um, but it may be a little too early to say. I guess one experiment we can do is if we skim some of that away, sort of tear the edge there, see whether it does that on the next oxide layer that forms. I'm also, um, so I think the, the first one I would like to try to accomplish it, and I, I managed to build like two cells uh, before I got frustrated with the um, flexible model of the, the tetra tetra uh, the Kelvin foam one. Um, but, I, but then I also found out that uh, rhombic dodecahedrons are really cool, and I want to try doing one um, with those at some point as well. Um, but probably at some point when I find a better way than... Um, the connector, the, the way I was making the connectors by um, cutting lengths of elastic rubber tubing and puncturing a hole in one and feeding them through each other to make four-way flexible joints, um, sort of a pain. So if I can, I might come up with a process to uh, 
uh, semi mass produce little connector joints so that all I would have to do would be um, uh, assemble things. And if they, uh, the other thing is that the, the little, um, uh, can I blow bubbles in bismuth? <laughs> not tonight. Um, and probably not in general. It's just, you know, splashing and sort of things. You'd have to, you'd need us, you know, maybe with a steel straw and a bunch of pressure. Um, you could certainly bubble air through the bismuth, but I don't think you could make it foam up necessarily unless it was at just the right temperature relative to its, uh, to its um, freezing point. Okay, huge link, tempted to click it. Oh yeah, there, yes, the squish, yes, it, it's, uh, it is quite a bit like the squish. Um, I've seen, I've seen those, those are fun. Um, and that's sort of the, the sort of the feel I imagine wanting to have with a, um, with a toy, this sort of structure with all this geometry that you can sort of bounce and deform and distort and, uh, um, uh, it doesn't suck. It just makes the chest go bounce and deform and distort. And um, because it's it's fun to look at a model like this, but I think it would be more fun if it were squishy and bouncy. Right. Okay. Plenty of crystallization from the edges. Some floating in the middle. We'll start to harvest the ones that are around before they grow too big. And then we'll see what we've got coming off of the copper wire here, if anything. I think in the past when I've tried this, it has not done anything, but the repeatability is not one of the hallmarks of my process just yet. So it is what it is. Yeah, that's pretty good, unrelated to the experiment, but a fine looking crystal. We got this one as well. Not as exciting, well, but not bad. Um, At some point I might want to reconsider my method with tweezers of pulling these things out, but it's the best way I know so far. And this, it's a big floating thingy. Um, I think it's big, it's big enough and, and I mostly just want to see how the crystals formed on it. So. Did they form in an interesting way? And the answer is, hey, pretty good. This this looks like uh, two main crystals. Um, so we have, uh, if I can hold this here, it looks like we have one going off sort of this way and then another one uh, going off this way or something like that. So um, that is, maybe this is an approach I will try again, which is, um, adding some copper wires to the top before turning it off uh, so that they get up to temperature and then act as sort of heat sinks to create a not a not a thermal shock but just a gentle cooling that's faster than the metal metal around them um, of course although and then uh, pro or con I'm not sure it's got a wire stuck in it that I could melt out if I melted this but that might be worth saving for a while um, let's put it where we can See it? Okay. Um, but I think for the for the next melt, what we haven't done for a while, um, just to keep going through my existing repertoire of things I already know how to do with bismuth, is um, I will. Uh, let it freeze for a bit and I will pour the bismuth into this and then we'll remelt on here and we'll take a look at the crystals that form inside this one. Um, and uh, as Owen has been, if there, if there are any suggestions for um, process experiments, I um, can't say whether I'll get to them tonight or ever, but feel free to uh, suggest them even if they are um, outlandish or dangerous. <laughs> Another one of the uh, talking points I often hit is 
Um, Pepto-Bismol <laughs> contains bismuth subsalicylate as uh, one of the active ingredients, um, which is just a fun fact. Not sure why bismuth subsalicylate is good for upset stomachs, but um, it is. And there are there are some, I don't, uh, I think I, I would present it differently if I were doing it. Um, there are some pretty fun videos nonetheless on YouTube of people actually uh, isolating the bismuth from Pepto-Bismol and using it to make bismuth crystals, um, which is pretty, I, I don't think it's easy to get the purity high enough. Uh, well, it's certainly, I think there are probably formulas that are branded as Pepto-Bismol that don't contain bismuth subsalicylate, but certainly, um, and it should, if the camera will focus, you should be able to read it right there under the bismol, bismuth subsalicylate. So at least some Pepto-Bismol products are still bismuth subsalicylate based. <laughs> Thank you, Owen. Um, typically, whatever you splash molten bismuth on will get hot. Yeah, I, I really sort of wonder how they discovered, I should, I should look it up, it's probably right on the Wikipedia page. Um, thing for me to look up and, and learn for another time so I can relate to people is, how did they even figure out that uh, this one salt of this one metal, um, subsalicylate salt of this one metal, would be you know, particularly effective in uh, helping people feel better? Well, that, is, that seems like a mystery. The, Relatedly, they like how they even discovered bismuth in the first place was that, um, as as far as I know, it or or the most plausible explanation to me is that um, it was this stuff left over when they purified lead. So you know you might be you might have some lead ores and want lead for ballast or other lead purposes, solder, pewter, whatever. Um, not that lead is you know a material we want to use much of these days, but maybe you're purifying lead for some reason. Maybe maybe you purified a bunch of silver ore and you had lead left over. And then you wanted to purify the lead, uh, and it, and then you got this other stuff left over, and that was the bismuth. Um, and uh, um, so you know, it's sort of this. As far as I know, it's known to chemistry as sort of a leftover material. And then you know, people found cool things to do with it, or maybe they learned that it makes uh, weird hopper crystals. Um, but I don't know how. And there's certainly other, a lot of other uses since then, but especially the like, you know, medicine seems like an unlikely place for it to uh, to wind up in use. So I'll have to look that up. Um, yeah, even so, rock, iron, splashing. Um, if there, well, one of the things is that even if bismuth is, well, bismuth is certainly soluble with other metal alloys uh, or with other metal elements and can form alloys, um, it's probably pretty unlikely to form them at 270 Celsius. Um, uh, so you need some, you know, with lower lower melting alloys. And, and something that I might actually play around with, with uh, uh, is melting much smaller amounts of bismuth and adding indium or gallium to see if I can get a low melting bismuth alloy and how that uh, crystallizes or solidifies. I, I don't think it'll be that special, but that'll be interesting to try at least, um, just to observe the properties. Um, but uh, um, the, so, so there wouldn't be necessarily much of a reaction or a crystallization. Mostly the bismuth will flow, it will oxidize where it's hot enough to, and then it will cool and uh and freeze and um maybe more interesting than doing than, than pouring other kinds of molten metal that are much hotter um or uh, reactive or destructive but um well and one thing one thing that i may try doing in future streams that, I, that i've played around with a little bit before is casting bismuth into molds um one form that people make uh, commercial bismuth crystals in is sort of, uh, sort, they call it geode or egg style, where you'll pour the bismuth into an eggshell, or I think you could pretty well do it with a silicone mold because sil uh, silicones do 
resists the temperature pretty well. And then if you pour the bismuth out at just the right point, um, you'll have it partially solidified and sort of like, so you'll, you'll have sort of an egg with this on the inside and it'll look really neat um, or a mold of something else. Uh, so I might want to do that on future streams. I also might want to just try casting, say, a little bismuth coin or something. Okay. Should have some crystals forming on this batch soon. Oh, yeah, and there they, so sometimes, right as I swipe the tweezers, um, hopefully get some focus here, focus here. Got some little triangles. These may or may not grow down into the melt much, but I'll, I'll harvest them when they get a bit bigger, and then, um, uh, and then I'll pour the metal out here. Okay, back from a momentary mute. Oh, and yeah, these uh, got this sort of Christmas tree triangle thing going on there. Um, we'll let this keep going for a bit. I'm going to step away from the molten metal quickly and take a water break. And every time I take a water break, uh, I step away from the molten metal because I don't want to get any water in the molten metal. It would just vaporize to steam and spray molten metal everywhere. It's important for uh, <laughs> important for streamers on Twitch to stay hydrated. Someday maybe I'll even have a robot in the chat reminding me to stay hydrated or rem reminding uh, my viewers to stay hydrated. Yeah, this is, these are growing pretty big. Oop, these two have merged. But they're very, very shallow. That not, uh, not intended as a slight. I mean, I do usually hope for features with more depth, but it's a pretty cool pattern, so I'm pretty excited about that. I do like to have some of these, especially when that one little nucleation point, or two in this case, I think, um, is visible on the back. I'll just try to get this away from the tweezers without shattering. All right, we'll set that there for now. Sorry, you can't see it. Um, next step is I'm going to, and I don't think I can necessarily get all of this in the shot. Oh yeah, actually I can. Make sure that I've got this very securely clamped and we'll pour this out. It makes really cool bismuth pouring sounds. And then we are left with a glittering alien city. Let's see if we get a little more light on that. Maybe. Playing around with manual focus now. Hmm, not great. And actually, it looks like I'm getting a tilt shift effect there. Okay, we'll go back to autofocus. Uh, it's all the way zoomed in. So. Okay, and now that we've done that, we'll, we'll look at this again a little bit more later. I might even want to break some crystals out of there. Uh, we will remount the other part that was um, like that before.
Huh. I guess it is. The, yeah, the heat ripples over the, the bowl are a pretty interesting effect that I'm pleased with. Um, so I'm, oh, I don't I want to be turning it down, not up. Uh, this should melt pretty quickly. While this melts, I'm going to try to prepare some more little bits of wire uh, and see whether I can repeat the earlier success with that experiment. And I think after one or two more melts, I will start the cool down phase. I'll, I'll keep hanging out, um, but I'll be just allowing the bismuth to cool and um, we'll watch as it freezes over and then we'll see it will we'll absorb this sort of um, bloop effect where since the business is since the bismuth expands as it freezes, um, it will force its way out through cracks in the surface of the solid bismuth as it freezes. Um, and it's just sort of weird and a little bit, um, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure how to describe it. Uh, it's just a little weird looking. Um, and, uh, might as well capture it on video tonight. melting along nicely. Oh, somehow this froze over at the top here a bit. Maybe just from all the, how much cooling ability there was of the whole uh, bunch of stuff I poured it onto. So I've got a bit more ways to go to melt this all. And start stacking up these bits of copper wire. I think just little coils. The idea would be that some of it is in the bismuth and some of it is not. It should help make sure that there's both a substrate for the bismuth to grab onto and a little antenna to radiate the, or to conduct the heat from the air or to the air. Uh, yes, the big island is probably pretty thin. Oh, the big island is gone now. Okay, yeah, this is about done. We will give this I'll just try to quickly get another piece of wire in here. And one last one. Okay, heat off. Got a whole bunch of 
oxide caught up on that one piece of wire there. I'm not going to worry about it too much. Hmm. All right, we'll see. Repeating an experiment. Again, I have very little control over it, but we'll, we'll find out what happens. Time to experiment with the focus, I suppose. I guess it's it's pretty well focused right now. The colors are so much different on the camera versus for the eye. Which suggests to me that I probably want to try a setup with the camera at a little bit of an oblique angle. Which might not have as cool of, you know, might, I don't know, there'd be pros and cons to doing that. I think this one is still pretty hot. Oh yeah, it's definitely overheated this one a bit. Not too far at this point. It's not oxidizing like crazy. Too, or too quickly. So this one is so close to the surface and buried in the bismuth that I don't know if it'll do much. But these ones all seem to have a, a bit of a, a good amount, like immersed versus um, above the surface, which I'm hoping is what will cause a good kind of uh, heat transfer and solidification. Oh, there's some, definitely some things happening. I think those are all small floating crystals. Let's take a look at this one. Oh, this one. Okay, so <laughs> too early. Metal not solid, or uh, bismuth not crystallizing on this yet. Shucks. I can try putting it back in there, but I think it's probably not going to work too well. Um, yeah, there's lots of crystals forming everywhere else. Let's try... No, that one's not doing much either. Nor is this. So we'll let them go longer and maybe plug out some of these side crystals. Oh, well, this is doing something actually. Okay, so this, this is somewhere in between. It's a, it's a cluster but not a, not a totally chaotic cluster. So this, I would call this a success. It looks pretty good. Whoop, as I drop it. <laughs> um, and then maybe by the time we get back to the others, they will also be pretty interesting. Looks like there's some other growth happening near that one. Oh, oh not, a, not a ton. Now we've got something here. Oh, but really not much. <laughs> we will we'll remelt that one for a second to last melt. Um, this one's got something. I'm probably just being too impatient. Yeah, I'm being too impatient with this one. So I'll have to remelt that. And this one also, okay. 
we will sort of re-homogenize here, melt one more time for the final melt of the night, um, and we'll see what we can do with these ones. While we're melting, let's see if we can get the camera to focus here so that you can hopefully see some of the fine, uh, very subtle, fine detail um, on this piece. Sorry, change the light a little bit. Showing sort of these concentric lines radiating out from central points. It's a little hard to pick out and maybe a little hard to see on the camera, but um, if it's working, or if, it, if the camera is showing it well enough, right about there, one of those points. We're theoretically, as few as two atoms just got together and decided to stop being liquid, start being solid. Um, that's how it went. get together with a whole other whole bunch of other atoms eventually millions and millions uh, I don't know I guess well yeah millions and millions um, maybe at some point I should have a, a representative molar mass of bismuth which would be something like 83 grams a bit more actually I'm sure um, no, I'd, I'd have to look. What's the, I forget what the average uh, atomic mass is. Someone may correct me at some point. Um, but anyway, it would be a pretty heavy chunk of bismuth for a whole molar mass. But um, the, you know, ten to the twenty-sixth atoms, six point oh two times ten to the twenty-sixth atoms. Uh, but even you know, that would still be an amount that you could hold in your hand pretty well. And uh, even these smaller amounts, even these smallest crystals are. Millions and millions and millions, if not billions, of crystal of uh, of atoms that all decided to line up in pretty similar ways, which I think is um, amazing that we can observe it sort of at the macroscopic scale, even though it comes from this sort of microscopic organization. Maybe I can be a little less impatient with uh, this round. Oh, thanks, Owen. 0 0.209 kilograms. So yeah, 200 grams is... Uh, I don't think I have a crystal that's 200 grams, but you can certainly add a bunch together. It's certainly a lot less than this, which is like probably... This is probably like 3 kilograms or so. Maybe 4 or 5. I don't know. It's, it's, it's heavy. This has got some growth. This has got some growth. And, oh, they've okay. So these all have growth attached to them. Let's see how it is. Hmm. This is nothing too special here. This is pointing sort of towards the um, hypothesis that maybe I got lucky on the first one I did, but. Uh, still worth trying to sort out what's uncontrolled and what's controlled in these tests. And also whether I should just be waiting longer. Because this is, yeah, I think, so we'll give this one more time. Move it to the center. 
feels a little heavier, but that could be the seating. And we can already see the crystals encroaching from the sides. Um, and it shouldn't, we'll, we'll see how long after we pull this crystal, but it shouldn't take too long to crust over and start um, bubbling out the, out the, somewhere in the middle. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I should probably have left this in for longer, but I think we'll just let it, it was just, just not, uh, Maybe it was, I think maybe the problem is that it's conducting all the heat away at the surface and not at the at the tip of the, oh, sorry. Need to look at the camera when I'm doing this. Um, not at the tip of the copper wire there. It just didn't seem to, whatever was happening there, the copper wire was staying hot and not doing stuff. So um, now is a great time for more questions. I will probably, uh, oh yeah, um, good idea. The Make a sphere or a cube for a molar mass, radius of 1.72 centimeters. Um, <laughs> I think the, um, uh, what I might end up doing is um, maybe I will print myself a mold of a mole scaled to be the right volume, and then I'll cast the bismuth into the shape of a mole that has approximately one molar mass of bismuth. Because uh, that would be very silly, and I'd like to be silly sometimes. Um, what, what is, what, so what's the, <laughs> so uh, while you're being my um, uh, voice uh, activated, um, mathematical or, or, or dictionary service, Owen, um, what's the volume of 0 0.209 kilograms of bismuth? I suppose I could just uh, ask Wolfram Alpha, but maybe so can you, or your choice of uh, data service. Torimon CCs. Oh, that's pretty small. Yeah, it would be, it would be easy to um, print a uh, print a master mold for that, make a silicone mold, and make a bismuth mold. <laughs> um, give, try to give Theodore Gray a run for his money. Um, not really. I have no inter interest in competing on, on that sort of scale with a periodic table enthusiast, but there's probably not a whole lot of cast metal moles of metal out there. Uh, so as this, yeah, as this cools, you can see the uh, liquid area, the area that's rippling, slowly shrinking. As the, um, as the molten bismuth expands, as it freezes, I, I don't know, right now it's the, the sort of level of the coastline is changing weirdly. Um, and maybe we can try to get some more light on it again. Pretty well, it's crusting over pretty well everywhere, but uh, the it, it's it's not uh, maybe not climactic, maybe a little anticlimactic, but it's still interesting that um, yeah we we're, we'll have this situation where it looks like you should just be able to freeze the whole thing over, but then whoops, instead it uh, it wasn't all the way frozen in the center and it forces itself out. Unless I mean it, it would be great. Um, there's that expression. A watched pot never boils. Totally unscientific, but it's entirely possible that uh, this unpredictable process will fail to do the thing that I've seen it do uh, every other time I've let it cool off. Um.
Ah, okay. Fewer, fewer and fewer, or less and less exposed bismuth. Solidification progressing. Usually at this point in demos, I just cover the thing with a bowl and uh, sort of, you know, turn one of these upside down on it, cover it, walk away for a bit. But uh, every so often it's nice to watch. And again, I don't know if this sort of phenomenon has quite been captured on camera before. So it's good to, uh, good to get it. All right, I'm stepping away briefly for another water break. Ah, here we go. You can see that it's starting to sort of swell upwards there as the uh, bismuth continues freezing, continues expanding. Liquid is slowly being forced to bubble up. Now, if I wiggle the table a little bit or tap this, there's nothing much happening, but this is still sort of, uh, the, the solidification is progressing and at some point uh, it should sort of bubble over a little bit. I sort of like to try to imagine what's happening on the inside with all these crystals growing in from the sides and growing together until they kind of squeeze the liquid out between them, but it's maybe not the best thing to imagine if you're claustrophobic. Um, well, these changes are subtle, but you can definitely see that it's created a, a sort of a raised area um, with, and, and it's still it's still slowly wiggling and I think sometimes it sort of shifts based on um, well, the surface tension or the or the oxide layer tension but sometimes it seems like it moves periodically, which I think is another one of the weird things. I'm not sure why it does that. Whether it relates to the steps of the hopper crystals forming on the inside or what. Uh, yeah, I think, so electromagnets are pretty likely for the next stream, uh, vibration and polarizers as well. Yes, um, I will We'll keep a note of that, and uh, I think next stream probably in, we'll see, I might start doing these more frequently, they might keep being every three weeks, but I will keep announcing them on my Twitter at least, and I will try to make sure to link my, um, whoop, excuse me, that's my alarm that tells me that it's 10 p.m., so in case you were all wondering, I didn't have clocks in front of you, it is now 10 p.m. on the East Coast. Um, so this one, so usually I see these uh, have a little blobs that run around, but this is really being more of a sort of a three-dimensional uh, mountain that's forming, sort of a, uh, oh, hey, there it goes, bismuth volcano, very small bismuth volcano. I think that's what I could call it. Um, and that may continue to do that for a few more minutes as well. Um, given that we've captured that, I will be 
wrapping things up pretty soon. Yep, it looks like it's doing just a little bit more, but uh, that's probably all for now. I'm going to keep recording in case it does any more stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I'll keep streaming. I'm just going to mute the stream for now. Thanks everyone for coming by. Have a good night.